Hi there, my name is Tian Guldnes, and on this video we will discuss praise God, but how? Because so many people don't understand what it actually means to say, I praise God, or we worship God, or what is praise and worship all about? Is it the same thing? Is it different? Is it only about the songs that we sing? Or might there be more regarding praising God and worshiping God that we read in the Word of God? So, my brother and sister, we must always go back to the Word of God to see what we can learn from the Word and not necessarily what people may tell us in our specific traditions or in the way that we grew up. We must always go back to the Word of God. And because God is the author of His own Word, and because it's always about our Lord Jesus Christ, first let us pray together first. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we glorify your name. Thank you, Lord. We know the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. So, Lord, we know you're here where we're busy with this recording, but you will also be there where people will be watching this video wherever they may be. And we pray that you alone will be glorified. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will take me out of the way, that I will not be the one speaking, but that your Holy Spirit will speak in and through me, and that all our hearts would be willing to receive the truth of the Word of God. And thank you, Father, that you still give us the authority to say to Satan, we bind your works now. Wherever we are busy with this video is holy ground because God is there. God lives within each one of us who are his children. And you will not steal this message from the ears of the children of God and you will leave in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, now we pray that you will cover us with your blood wherever we may be. We pray that you will set up your angels all around us and that you yourself will be a wall of fire around about your children according to Zechariah 2 verse 5 so that every place is a safe place while we're busy. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Please take us by the hand and lead us now by your Holy Spirit. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, in this video, we will discuss the following six points, namely, number one, the world's way versus God's way. Number two, dance like David danced. Number three, don't judge, praise. Number four, intimate relationship spells praise. Number five, whose God is God? And number six, be renewed. Now, all who know me know I always start with this verse in the King James Version of the Bible. And if you wonder why I'm always using the King James Version, I now also have a new YouTube video on why do Bible versions differ that you can go and watch for yourself. But I read in my Bible in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 13, For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. And today you and I will read what the Bible says regarding praising and worshipping God. And you will see, we will be able to read it as it is written and understand it as it is written. Because in Matthew 22 verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, that means you are deceived, you make mistakes, you are misled. Why? Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And my brother and sister, it's also true regarding our praise and worship. In many instances, we are deceived in the way that we think may be the right kind of worship because we do not know our scriptures. But you see, the moment that we get to know the author of the scriptures and get baptized by his Holy Spirit and receive the gift of the discernment of spirits, what happens? We also get to know the power of God. The power of God also in our praise and worship regarding this living God that you and I serve. Because we must understand, my brother and sister, it's always about a personal, intimate relationship with the author of this book. He had this book written. God is in charge of his own word and he tells us how he wants us to live. It's not about how we see it, how we think it's acceptable or how it makes me feel or Ooh, I had such a good supernatural experience. We will get back to that and see what the Bible says regarding that. But we must understand, we must always go back to the scriptures and ask the author of the scriptures to reveal the truth of the scriptures in our hearts through his Holy Spirit, who now lives within us, if you and I are his children. At number one, let us discuss the world's way versus God's way. Now picture this, a capacity crowd in any well-known sports stadium anywhere in the world. The two teams are even, and there are only seconds of play left. The home team scores a goal. The crowd roars. Every single fan is on his feet, bellowing at the top of his voice. The well-known Mexican way floods around the stadium, around and around again. There are smiles everywhere, and the exuberance is contagious. It flows through the whole crowd. 
and after the final whistle blows, the cheering, dancing crowds flow into the streets to celebrate their team's victory in the city and at home. And I made a little note here for you to go and, and watch. Feel free to watch this short video by the skit guys called Idol Worship at that link. Now picture this. The following day, Sunday morning in many churches in that very same city, many of the previous day's crowd attend their churches. Smiles are few. Of the previous day's exuberance, there is no sign. The preacher talks about the greatest victory ever won by anyone, namely the victory of Jesus Christ over death, sin and destruction on the cross at Calvary. The preacher is on fire as the Holy Spirit speaks through him, and he tries his best to explain to his congregation that as a result of this, they are all a part of the winning team. God's elect, only a few congregation members, really share in his exhilaration regarding this wonderful knowledge. Then he gives up the hymn for the congregation to sing. Slowly the congregation members stand up and start to sing the hymn. There are still only a few smiles. Most faces are actually quite grim. Even though the words of the hymn urges them to lift their hands to the victorious Lord Jesus Christ, very few hands raise skyward. What on earth is happening here? Well, what is really happening is that we have learned to worship new gods, in quotation marks, in the manner the one and only creator God is supposed to be worshipped. Like our sport gods, for example. Have you also heard or read sports commentators saying things like, the golfing gods were good to him, or the soccer gods are smiling down at him, or even, we are at the hallowed ground of ABC Stadium, whatever the stadium's name is, and remember the word hallowed means holy, so we are at the holy ground of so-and-so stadium, or the 10 most hallowed grounds in American sports, etc. Yes, I've seen it. Yes, I've heard it more than once. And here are some examples for you as well. At the top left, a little picture that I got on the internet, and on the eighth day, God created the rugby. If you don't think that's idolatry, my brother and sister, you need to read your Bible again. Bottom left, the gods of rugby heaven. Bottom right, South Africa's Springboks, the ultimate gods of rugby. Top right, the gods of snooker. In the middle, the soccer gods. In the top, in the middle, tennis from the gods. Carlos Alcaraz makes sensational recovery to win a point. It was March this year in 2024, as reported on Sky Sports. In the middle, why US Open ended in heartbreak for Rory McIlroy. The golfing gods got in the way, also reported by Sky Sports. What are we doing, my brother and sister? You see, we think these people are gods and they are actually worshipped. The way that some of the fans, some of the people, some of their followers behave around these sporting stars, you can very, very clearly see it's idolatry in action. It is the worship of man. Whereas the Bible says in Romans 1, verse 21 to 23, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Why? Because it's vain to think that people can be gods. They became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. So we must get to a place of worshipping the God of the Bible in the way that we actually worship or idolize the sporting stars and other and well-known celebrities upon this earth. Because in Revelation 15 verse 4 we read, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. My brother and sister, you must understand, you and I will stand before God's throne alone one day and all nations will come and worship before him. They will fall down flat before him, because then they will understand they became vain by worshipping their sporting gods, or their celebrity gods, or whatever other gods they were following. So you and I need to be different and remember that we worship a holy God. That's why we also strive after sanctification, after holiness, the way he wants us to do, and he lives within us now, and he helps us with that. But where do we find our answers 
to the real way, the one and only true God is supposed to be praised and worshipped only in the Bible and nowhere else. Because 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. My brother and sister, look at the word there. All scripture, not just certain parts. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for number one, doctrine, number two, reproof, number three, correction, and number four, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God, the person of God, the child of God, you and I, may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Then we need to be able and willing to learn from all of scripture, which is given by inspiration of God, so that we can receive the truth of sound doctrine, of reproof from the Bible, of correction where we're wrong, and instruction in God's righteousness, His way of doing things. I also have a YouTube video on what is righteousness all about that you can go and watch. Joshua 1 verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. That means you shall not stop talking about the word of God. But thou shalt meditate there in day and night. In what shall we meditate? In the word of God. How many times? Day and night that thou, that you, may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So my brother and sister, do you want to have good success, and do you want to make your way prosperous? Then you need to talk about the things of the Word of God. You need to meditate on the Word of God day and night, and you need to observe to do according to all that is written therein, including how you praise and worship God. Very clearly then, we should read our own Bibles and meditate there on day and night. Not just once or twice a week on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday evening at a prayer meeting. We also read that the people who listened to Paul checked what he said in Acts 17 verse 10 to 12. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, so they were willing to listen to Paul and Silas. But then they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. You see, my brother and sister, they did not just accept everything that Paul and Silas told them on face value. They listened to them. They were willing to receive their word with all readiness of mind. But then they went home and they checked their scriptures daily to see whether these things that Paul and Silas said to them were so or not. And that is what you and I must also do. Because when we do that, we can also see how people start to believe. Because what they heard, they now read in the Bible and they see it's the same thing. So then they also start to believe. And that's why I always say, don't believe me. Please go and check everything that I say in your scriptures for yourself. When we learn to read our scriptures in this way and get to know what the author of the scriptures wants to teach us regarding anything in his word, that will also include that we will really get to know how to praise and worship him according to the word. But that also includes that through knowledge of his word, under the leading of his Holy Spirit, we will also be able to discern when certain forms of praise and worship are not in line with his word. Our worship must always be about God and nothing and nobody else, including myself and how it makes me feel. Because so many people say, oh, I feel so good when I praise and worship, but afterwards nothing changes in their lives. So it's not about how I feel. It's about are we praising and worshiping God? Is it all about God? Because I watched a little video by R.C. Sproul. Uh, a little while ago on worship where he said the following and he was speaking from the book of Genesis referring to the offering that the sacrifice that Cain made to the Lord and the sacrifice that uh, Abel made to the Lord so they both worshiped the Lord in their sacrifice but what do we learn from this he said the following the first thing we must learn from this text is that God does not accept all forms of worship that are offered to him and that is a scary thought what if my worship is not acceptable to God? What if my worship is offensive or displeasing to Him? Then I need to change my kind of worship and find out what is pleasing to Him. My brother and sister, this is a very important point. It's always about God. 
He is God. He gets to make the rules. He's a loving father, but he's still God. And he gives us his word so that we can live according to that. Now, on this video, I will be discussing two different mainstream groups of believers. One will be the traditional kind of churches, and the other will be the new modern charismatic kind of churches, who both believe that their way of worship is the only correct way, but who may just both need to go before the Lord and inquire whether their way of worship is indeed acceptable or pleasing to Him, no matter what their reverence, their priests, their preachers, or their pastors tell them. My brother and sister, we must always understand, it's always about God first. You know, He does not owe us anything. We must understand that. He's God. He gave us eternal life through what His Son did for us. He gave us His Word so that we can live according to that. And we will stand before His throne one day in all eternity. And then we will do everything according to what He said and what He wants us to do in eternity. Why? Because He's God. He's a loving Father and He's the only one who is worthy of all praise and worship. But then we need to do it according to His rules and His regulations, not to what my friends' opinions are or what people may think it may be. So we will need to see what the Bible says regarding this. At number two, let us now discuss dance like David danced. In 2 Samuel 6, verse 12 to 23, you can go and read that whole passage for yourself again. We read, and it was told King David, saying, The Lord, and remember when you read the word Lord like that in the King James Version, L-O-R-D, in the capital letters, in the Hebrew it is written, yod Hey vav Hey, because our father's name in Hebrew is Yahweh. The Lord, Yahweh, hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom, and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God that stood in the house of Obed-Edom for a while. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. The dictionary defines gladness also as joyful, joyous, happy, merry. So when we are busy with God, it is something to be joyful about. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength, the Bible says in Nehemiah 8 verse 10. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that is why, my brother and sister, if the devil can steal our joy, he steals our strength. So if he can get us to a place of not joyfully worshipping and praising God, he can steal our strength. But back to David. And it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen effort. I believe David was certainly one of the greatest kings Israel has ever had. And look how he conducted himself before the Lord. He danced with all his might. Now what would constitute dancing with all your might? Do you think it is one foot tapping a slow rhythm on the ground? Or not even moving in a church pew at all while singing praises and worshipping God? So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. When I read this verse, I immediately recall that sports stadium again, filled with people shouting and many of them blowing different kinds of trumpets. Then I also recall those same people the following morning in different churches, not moving a muscle before the Lord. Not only that, some of those same people even judge other people who do indeed praise and worship God with joy and gladness in their meeting, or they condemn people who blow ram's horns at their meetings. But this is also nothing new if we look at the way David's own wife judged him for his conduct. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, who was Saul's daughter, but she was David's wife as well, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. The tragedy of it all is that even to this very day, some Christians despise other Christians in their hearts for dancing or leaping or shouting before the Lord. 
Just like Michal was very sarcastic towards David, as can be seen in the above scripture, many of today's Christians also make sarcastic comments about such other Christians who move under the guidance of the Holy Spirit at that specific moment of their worship. From the Bible, however, we see that David wasn't perturbed by his wife's tirade. And David said unto Michal, It was before the Lord, which chose me before thy father and before all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. In other words, David is saying, I don't care what you say or what you think, what the servants say or think. I know what God caused in my life and what God did with me. And so I will worship him with gladness and with everything in me and with all my might. So this was definitely not the normal way today's Christians would behave. Unfortunately, most followers of Christ today are more concerned about what the people may think or say about them than about God's personal smile of approval. Interestingly, they don't mind what the people may think about them when they sometimes behave like drunken animals in certain sports stadiums. But they are so worried about what those same people may think about them at church. This in contrast to the words of Galatians 1 verse 10 that says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. You see, my brother and sister, so many of those people, when they go to the sports stadiums, you know, they wear all these horns and they paint their faces and they be really behave in some instances like animals with the horns and with the faces and with the drinks they drink and all that. Then they don't mind what people think of them. But when they walk into the house where God wants to teach us about his word when they are with other children of God. Suddenly, oh, what will people think of me if I lift up my hands? What will people think of me if I clap my hands? Suddenly they worried about what people think of them, but not out there in the world when they behave not like children of God. At number three, let us look at don't judge, praise. We proceed to read in 2 Samuel 6, verse 12 to 23. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. Do you see the fruit of Michal's conduct in despising David for dancing and shouting and leaping before the Lord with all his might? She was barren for the rest of her life. It was a judgment that she brought upon herself. This is a very clear warning that every Christian should take to heart. Don't judge other Christians for the way they praise and worship God. If what they are doing is from God and pleases Him, that is between the Lord and those worshippers, and He is then glorified. However, if what they are doing or promoting through their worship is not in line with Scripture, then we need to reprove them and expose that so that they can also change their kind of worship. But then we need to know our own Bibles to know whether they are in line with Scripture even with their praise and worship or not. Because Ephesians 5 verse 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that word reprove in the Greek also means expose them. So don't have fellowship with places that have these praise and worship meetings, but it's all about the spiritual feeling and an I feel so good, but the songs that they sing are not in line with Scripture. Now let us look at a few other passages about praising our God. Psalm 109 verse 30 says, I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yea, I will praise him among the multitude. So look at that now. I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yea, I will praise him among the multitude. Clearly, I will not just praise him softly in my mind. The Hebrew word used as greatly is mohode. And it literally means, according to Strong's Hebrew and Greek dictionary, that is vehemently, by implication, holy, speedily, louder and louder. The Hebrew word used as praised here is yoda, which means to throw up the hands in worship. So I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth and I will throw up my hands in worship. Oh, but in so many churches, we don't lift a hand past our ears because we're so worried about what the people may think of me or my grandfather or grandmother would say. But we'll get back to that a little bit later because our traditions also keep us from worshiping God according to the word. To greatly praise the Lord actually means then to use my mouth louder and louder 
while throwing up my hands in praise and worship. This sounds like shouting or loudly singing or loudly proclaiming to me. To return to our initial example of that sports stadium, I believe that the psalmist would also have used the words Mehode and Yoda if he were to witness such a modern sports event. How could I say such a thing? Because that is exactly what the people at such an event are doing. They are using their mouths louder and louder while throwing up their hands, praising their team for their efforts. Why, oh why, do we find it so difficult to do the same for our Lord and King, even though the Bible urges and actually commands us to do exactly that? Is it because Satan has lied to us for too long, using his demon spirit of religion? Because the demon spirit of religion is the one causing us not to praise our Lord and King Jesus Christ in the manner we are instructed to do in the Bible. He is the one who brings in all the arguments about only certain musical instruments that may be used in church, or that we may not raise our hands in worship, or whatever else is against the Word of God. Unfortunately, thousands upon thousands of Christians are bound by this spirit and listen to that demon instead of following the Bible's clear instructions about this and other spiritual matters. But how do we resist Satan regarding our praises? I believe that it is by doing what James 4 verse 7 says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you, and by praising the Lord any time of the day and anywhere I go. And no, it doesn't only mean singing songs of praise wherever I go. My whole life, my whole daily demeanor must actually be praise and worship to God, my brother and sister. You see, my brother and sister, it's not about the songs that we sing. Praise and worship is all about our whole personal lives as well. But let's proceed. Psalm 22 verse 3 says, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Isn't that awesome? God inhabits. He lives in our praises. He doesn't live in our mumblings, murmuring, or rebellion. Do we ever stop to think why this would be so? May it just be because he delights himself in us? As we read in Zephaniah 3 verse 17, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. My brother and sister, have you ever seen this passage in the Bible? That God himself, the creator of heaven and earth, our heavenly father, the almighty, omniscient, omnipotent, awesome God, rejoices over you and I with joy that he sings over us in his joy. Why would Satan try to keep this passage hidden from us? Because he knows that if we realize this wonderful fact, we will not be able to do anything else but to do exactly the same in return by rejoicing over him with joy and by singing to him in our joy. I personally believe it is because so many Christians have not yet appropriated this beautiful verse in the Bible for themselves and are not really in a personal, intimate relationship with God, that they struggle to break through into that place of exuberant praise and worship to our mighty Father and Creator God. And how can I say Christians are not in a relationship with God? I also have a YouTube video on culture, tradition, and religion that you can go and watch for yourself to see the difference. Psalm 9 verse 1 and 2 says, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Psalm 32 verse 11 says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. My brother and sister, why don't we see this in many places in our traditional churches? Why don't we see this gladness in the Lord? Why don't we see this rejoicing? Why don't we see these shouts of joy? Because our traditions have bound us over the years. Is it possible to be glad, to rejoice, to sing and to shout in a quiet, religious and fashionable manner? Or would you be willing to agree that the praising of God may just be something other than what many of us grew up to believe in our churches? But as I said, our personal lives are also supposed to be lives of praise and worship to God. Every part of our lives should praise and worship our King. The way we speak to our husbands and our wives, or our children, or our colleagues at work, should bring praise 
to our King and Heavenly Father. The way we talk should exalt Him. The way we drive our cars and show good manners to other road users should glorify God. There is not a single part of our lives that can be exempt from showing worship and praise to God. And this can only really happen if we have the fear of the Lord as part of our lives. Because Psalm 22 verse 23 says, Ye that fear of the Lord, praise Him. And my brother and sister, I also have a whole full length YouTube video on the fear of the Lord that you can go and watch for yourself because people don't understand what the difference is between the fear of the Lord and the fear that Satan brings. I believe that Satan stole our praises of God by letting us misunderstand the fear of the Lord for many ages. He taught us also through the workings of the spirit of religion I spoke about earlier, albeit through our traditions or our preconceived ideas or even in our different churches, that the fear of the Lord meant to be afraid of God. So afraid, in fact, that we would not want to approach His throne of grace because we are too afraid to. So we ask the pastor to approach on our behalf or the minister or the reverend to go to God on our behalf because we're too afraid. So afraid that we do not dare raise our voices when singing to Him. So afraid that we would not dare lift our hands to Him. You know, here in South Africa, we even have signboards outside some of our churches reading Silence Church. So you must be silent when you pass that place because there's a church going on in there, but it must be silent. This is in stark contrast to the following passage from the Bible. Hebrews 4 verse 15 and 16 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I think you would agree that to come boldly unto the throne of grace is not the same thing as being too afraid to even approach him yourself. So if we had this misconception that we had to be afraid of God, where did this originate? The Bible is very clear about the origin of that fear. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If God did not give us a spirit of fear, who did? Nobody else but Satan himself. He is the one that wants us to believe that we must be so afraid of God that we would not want or dare to come near him. Unfortunately, he has succeeded with this line in many people's lives, even in their churches. Where are you in your relationship with God, friend? Are you still so afraid of God that you don't want to come near him? So you'd rather ask your preacher or your pastor to go and ask the Lord what you must do and come and tell you, but for the rest of the week you don't do nothing yourself? Or are you already in that place of awe, reverence, respect and love for him because that is what the fear of the Lord causes in a child of God and all a reverence a respect and a love for him that pulls you closer to God so or are you already in that place of all reverence respect and love for him growing from an intimate personal relationship with him that draws you boldly before his throne of grace there where you can also learn to become more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ because you see, my brother and sister, when you really get to know your scriptures, because you got to know the author of the scriptures, and you are in a personal, intimate relationship with him, you learn how he is, who he is, what he wants from us, and that pulls you closer to him. And then you want to become more like him. You see, but if you only sing these praise and worship songs, and you walk away and you're not changed, then you must understand you're not busy with the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible wants us to change. He does not want us to stay the way we are. He wants us to change from our old ways to His new way so that He can be glorified. And this is what we must understand. The fear of the Lord pulls me closer to God. The closer I get to God, the more I want to be like Jesus. And the more I get to be like Jesus, the less I become like the world. But that is not what Satan wants you and I to know. He wants us to stay in the world and be like the world. At number four, let us discuss intimate relationship spells praise. When I have such an intimate personal relationship with the Lord Jesus, it will automatically bring me into a place of praise and worship and cause me to reach out to others around me 
because Psalm 30 verse 12 and 13 says, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. And then we also read in Isaiah 61 verse 1 to 3, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Yes, that referred to Jesus, but it also refers to you and I today who are Holy Spirit filled, reborn children of God. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. You see, what immediately happens to a person when God releases him from his old life, from all the old rubbish he carried with him all his life, he becomes full of joy and only wants to dance and praise the Lord in all eternity. Such a person then realizes that the words of Isaiah 61 verse 1 to 3 is also applicable to him or her, and that he must also start to hand out to others the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And that's what you and I can also do, handing out the oil of joy in other people's lives when we share with them what God did for us. And we can also then hand out to them the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness because then they can start to understand the more because then they can also start to understand that the closer they get to God and the more they take up their authority they will be set free from the spirit of heaviness and then they can also praise and worship God with the love that he's put in their heart why would that be because joy takes away my mourning remember the joy of the Lord is my strength so if Satan can steal my joy, he steals my strength. And I start to mourn and I start to be negative and all these kinds of things. But the moment that I start to walk in God's joy again, it gives me strength. It takes away my mourning and praise destroys my heaviness. Please don't tell me that this passage in the Bible in its context is only applicable to Jesus. Why not? Because you and I, as children of God, are joint heirs of everything that was appointed unto him. How dare I say such a thing, you ask? My brother and sister, I just read the Bible as it is written. So read with me in Hebrews 1 verse 2. As in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Because God created the worlds through Jesus. And I also have a whole YouTube video on God is a Trinity, a triune God, where I explain this, that you can go and watch for yourself. But you see, God appointed Jesus as heir of all things. And then Galatians 4, verse 6 and 7 says, And because ye are sons, that word there also means children of God, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son then an heir of God through Christ. Can you see that? If you're a child of God, then you are also an heir of God through Christ. And Romans 8 verse 16 and 17 says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So can you see you and I, are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ of what? Of all things that was appointed unto him. Now regarding all the different arguments on the different instruments that may be used in praise and worship, I read in Psalm 150 verse 3 to 5, Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with a psaltery, that means a lyre, and harp. Praise him with the timbrel, that's a tambourine, and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Those are reed instruments. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high sounding cymbals. The first time I really understood them correctly, these verses hit me between the eyes like a jackhammer. Especially when I listen to some churchgoers complaining about different musical instruments being used in their church. 
This is the way I grew up as well. We were so negative about any new instruments being brought into our church because we only listen and praise God with our huge church organ. If I read these verses line upon line, just as they are written, where do we see that only huge ornate church organs may be used to praise God? We don't read it in the Bible. If we don't find it in the Bible, obviously it must come from some human writings. And if it comes from such human writings, at what stage did those human writings or human traditions become more important than the Bible itself? Jesus warned us very clearly about that very thing in Mark 7, verse 6 to 13, where he says, He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah, that's Isaiah, prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it? In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered. And many such like things do ye. Let us stop allowing our human traditions from rejecting the commandment of God. What do I mean? Because I read from this passage that those human traditions make the word of God of none effect. That's a very scary thought, my brother and sister, but it was spoken by Jesus himself. And without any doubt, that can only come straight from Satan's personal arsenal. To return to Psalm 150, I don't think trumpets, loud cymbals, and high-sounding cymbals make soft, soothing, religious noises. Yet the word of God states clearly that that is the way we should praise him. Strange that the way we think we should praise him and the way the Bible states we should are two different things in so many churches today. Again, remember Cain and Abel. And remember that not all forms of worship are acceptable to God. And is this form of worship acceptable to God, my brother and sister? The following verse teaches me for how long I will want to praise and worship him. In Psalm 34 verse 1, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Clearly, this means exactly what it says. I will bless, this word bless in the Hebrew also means praise, the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Do I read in this verse that I will only praise him at the church meeting once or twice a week? Not really. Because I believe continually means exactly that. Continually. Day in and day out. With my whole life, as I said. But when I do get to those fellowship meetings, what must happen there? Psalm 35 verse 18 says, I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Where am I going to give thanks and praises? In the great congregation and among many other people, not only where I'm alone. Sure, it includes my praises in the church building, but it most definitely also includes when I am among much people, including many of my own friends, family or colleagues, because even there, my life must praise and worship God. But let's proceed to see what the Bible says when, how, and for how long we are supposed to praise and worship our wonderful Heavenly Father. Psalm 44 verse 8 says, In God we boast, that word boast in Hebrews also praise, all the day long, and praise thy name forever. Psalm 113 verse 3, From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, in other words, from the morning to the evening, the Lord's name is to be praised. These verses confirm what I said earlier, that my whole life on a daily basis should praise and worship the Lord. Because of course, you cannot sing praise and worship songs from the morning to the evening. So yes, there are times when you will sing, walking on your own or driving in your car or whatever, or being among friends and you also start to worship God in your singing. But for the rest of the day, when you're not singing, your life must be the love song, the praise and worship song to God, to, to praise God in the way that you act and react towards people. Psalm 47, verse 1, 6, and 7 say the following, O clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto the God with the voice of 
triumph. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises unto our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. What must all ye people of God do? Surely all the people include all Christian believers. They must all clap their hands, shout unto God, and sing praises to our King. I think you will agree that to shout with the voice of triumph is not something that is whispered softly behind the hands. And that verse also states, clap your hands. Why, oh why, are we so afraid to raise our voices to glorify God, or to clap our hands, or lift our hands when we sing praises to Him then? Again, is it because our human traditions that we grew up in have become more important to us than what the Bible says? Or is it because what people standing around me may think about me has become more important to me than what God may think about me? I remember in my years in a traditional Reformed church where I was even an elder in the church, how we used to refer to the Pentecostal churches as happy clappies. And we were quite sarcastic about that because they are clapping and lifting their voices. No, you know, that's not the way you, you worship God. No, they are happy clappies. So what did that make me and my friends who were pointing fingers at them saying they were happy clappies? Were we then surly and unhappy and grim? What were we then if they were happy, according to the word of God, clapping their hands? Speaking of clapping hands, let's see what the word says regarding raising or lifting up of hands in praise and worship. Psalm 63 verse 3 to 5 says, Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. I will lift up up my hands in thy name. I will. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Psalm 134 verse 1 and 2. Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. To bless the Lord also means to praise Him. So my brother and sister, what are we doing if we don't want to lift our hands? You see, we so struggle to get these two things past these two things to start to praise the Lord. Because what will my grandfather say? What will my grandmother say if she sees me, she sees me now or clapping my hands to the Lord? It's not about what grandfather or grandmother may say, my brother and sister. Those are traditions. And a friend of mine showed us a little picture that somebody sent him once regarding what is the definition of tradition. Tradition is peer pressure from dead people. So why worry about peer pressure from dead people? Let us rather worry what the author of the scriptures asked from us on how to praise and worship him by lifting our hands, using our mouths, clapping our hands when we praise and worship. But when we don't sing the songs, our lives must be examples of praise and worship to God so that He can be glorified. At number five, let us now look at whose God is God. Psalm 118 verse 28 says, Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. He is my God, and for that specific reason will I praise Him and exalt His name. In the same manner, He is also your God, the moment that you accept and receive him as your savior. So the question then, my brother and sister, are you praising him? Are you exalting him? Not just in your praise and worship songs, but also in your life. And the moment I make that choice and enter into a loving, intimate relationship with him, I will also realize the following, as David said in Psalm 119 verse 97, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. My personal relationship with our living creator, God, will cause me to also love his laws and instructions and to meditate thereon all day long. You see, not to meditate on the gospel songs I sang. That's not what I must meditate on. I must meditate on his word all the day long. Why? Because the more I meditate on God's word, the more I will become like Jesus and the more sanctified and holy life I will live which in turn will cause me to praise and worship Him even more 
yes in my singing but also in my life which in turn will cause me to want to exalt and glorify him which in turn will make me want to be more and more obedient to him which in turn will cause me to live a more sanctified and holy life what a wonderful circle of life don't you agree what will happen to me when i meditate on god's instructions on a daily basis psalm 119 there's 171 and 172 say the following my lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes look at that my lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes my tongue shall speak of thy word see that my tongue shall not speak of the gospel songs that we sang at the church my tongue shall speak of thy word so yes we praise and worship with our gospel songs but the word is what it is all about for all thy commandments are righteousness and then psalm 150 verse 6 says let everything that hath breath praise the lord praise ye the lord and yes my lips will utter praise when god has taught me his statutes from his word you see it starts with the word so if i praise and worship it is after i've heard the word and the word has taught me something it has released something in me then i praise and worship it's not the other way around it's not just going to a place and having a praise and worship evening but there's not much word being shared and then i go home and i just hum the song that we sang the whole night and i had this anointing and all these goosebumps but yet there was no word really shared with me and then i only have the song going around and around in my head and not all the gospel songs we sing my brother and sister contain good theology we'll see a little bit later beware some of the words that we sing but when we look at the original hebrew in which the old testament was written we find the following words used in different passages in the bible which all denote praise to the lord yoda means to praise god with outstretched hands so why can't we get our hands past our ears when we praise the Lord, my brother and sister? Because the demon spirit of religion is binding us and we must get rid of that demon. Zamar means to touch the strings and is used in the Bible every time reference is made to instrumental worship. Toda also means to praise God with outstretched hands. But it includes a further element, namely in worship, reverence, exaltation and acknowledgement psalm 50 verse 23 says whoso offereth praise toda glorifieth me because in the hebrew when you go to jerusalem and you say toda to the jews there it means thank you so you also thank god in that shabach means to praise god with a shout and a loud voice psalm 63 verse 3 because thy loving kindness is better than life my lips shall praise shabach thee tehila means praise from the spirit from the heart of the believer but also to sing to worship psalm 22 verse 3 but thou art holy o thou that inhabitest the praises the tehila of israel my brother and sister can you see there's much more to just praising god and saying oh we're going to praise god or we're going to have a praise and worship now you know and it's it's three fast songs and then it's uh, uh four slower songs because praise must be faster songs and worship must be slower songs it's much more than that much more than how we praise and worship in our songs it's about our whole life and how we live before god and what example we are to the people around us with what we do according to the word of god and how we live in that praises god as well my whole life praises god and that is what it's all about my brother and sister at number six let us now end with be renewed if i look at those hebrew words that we ended with in the previous chapter why are we so in contrast to the old israelites in many of our traditional churches today why don't we do the same today in our praise and worship of our king and master what has changed over the years that caused many believers today to think we may not dance or shout or make a noise before our lord what exactly led us to the point where we formed the opinion and we're eventually convinced that it must be so in the church that god can only be praised or worshipped with long sad faces and with stiff joints that cannot bend before his throne could it be because jesus christ is not a reality to many churchgoers because in many instances they have not yet truly entered into an intimate personal relationship with him themselves i can hear you say nonsense you're talking a load of rubbish 
This is the way I worship God because this is how I feel comfortable about it. This is the way I grew up and this is the way I believe God must be worshipped. Period. I hear you, dear friend. But if you look at all the passages and texts I quoted from the Bible so far, doesn't it look as though God wants us to praise and worship Him differently than what we always thought or grew up to believe? Are we supposed to praise and worship Him according to what our parents or our church taught us or how I feel comfortable about it or according to what the Word of God teaches us? After all, are we going to appear before our parents' throne one day or before our preacher's throne? No, we are going to appear before our Heavenly Father's throne. And what are we going to say to Him when He asks us about the way we praised and worshipped Him? There is a sad church joke which is told regularly here in South Africa and it goes like this. A Pentecostal Christian went to a more traditional church service. During the service, the preacher would say something uplifting and then the visitor would cry out loudly, Praise the Lord! This happened two or three times. And then one of the elders of the church walked quietly up to the man and whispered in his ear, Brother, in this church, we don't praise the Lord. Many people laugh at this, but I think it is actually very sad. For this joke illustrates the line of thought in so many traditional churches today that we cannot cry out, Praise the Lord if we agree about something that somebody said regarding the Word of God. The Bible teaches us to be renewed when we enter into a personal relationship with Him. Ephesians 4 verse 22 to 24 say that you put off concerning the former conversation, the former behavior, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You see, this is what we must wear. The new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Not hypocrisy, true holiness. What does it mean to be renewed? Is it not to be changed, to be different to the way we were before? Specifically, not to be the way we were in the past or did things in the past. Because Ephesians 5 verse 19 to 20 say, Speaking to yourselves in psalms, look at this now, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, my brother and sister, it's interesting in many of our traditional churches in South Africa, in the different traditional denominations, some of the congregation members are not allowed to sing hymns because in our church we only sing psalms. Now, you're not allowed to sing psalms because in our church we only sing hymns. No, 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 you can't sing any other spiritual songs. It's either psalms or hymns. No, my brother and sister, please look at what the Bible says. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But then we must ensure that they are in line with Scripture, with the Word of God. You see, the moment you enter into a real intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, your whole being cries out to Him, and you enter a new level of praise and worship that will totally renew and change the way you want to praise and worship Him. Yes, let us praise and worship an awesome, great and almighty God the way He wants us to. And we read that He says in Colossians 3 verse 16 and 17, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Look at this now. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Look at this again. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. You see, my brother and sister, even our psalms, our hymns, and our spiritual songs must be able to teach and admonish us. Not just make me feel good. So if I have a worship song that says, I love you and I love you forever, that doesn't say anything. Because I can sing that to my wife. Or you can sing it to your girlfriend. No, no. It must be a song that teaches me something, 
that admonishes me if I'm busy with the wrong things. It must not just be something, something that makes me feel so good. This is what we must understand, that even our gospel songs must be in line with Scripture. But then we have the second group of worshipers. I said at the beginning, I'm discussing two groups on this video. The first group are the traditional churchgoers, the way that I grew up. The second group are these modern charismatic churchgoers that have all these praise and worship evenings and get togethers. And it's all about the feeling and they have these spiritual experiences and all that. Many modern day worshipers in many Pentecostal or charismatic churches are adamant that they do exactly all these things in their worship that I spoke of earlier on this video. They shout and holler and sing louder and louder. They use a variety of loud instruments and they dance and jump for joy when they praise and worship in their churches. So they may not think any of these things I mentioned so far are applicable to them. They all have these awesome supernatural experiences while they praise and worship and they feel so rejuvenated and alive when they go home after hours of praising and worshiping they like to say yet in many of those instances and again i'm not saying in all those instances i'm saying in many of those instances there was no preaching of the true word and there was no conviction of the holy spirit and there are no changed lives afterwards. And that, my brother and sister, is the fruit that you must check. And the moment you talk to them about sin, holiness, sanctification, righteousness, or God's judgment, you are immediately blasted as being legalistic or holier than thou or too much. And I also have a new YouTube video on legalistic or law abiding that you can go and watch for yourself to see what the difference is. Because how dare you question those good feelings and goose bumps that they had while praising and worshipping God? How dare you question their supernatural experience and the anointing they felt? You see, they forget that Satan himself can also give people supernatural experiences because Satan is also a supernatural being. He comes like an angel of light. Many forget that to worship also means to bow in submission and to fall down in surrender before God and to be willing to serve God on His terms and on conditions with my whole life, not just while busy singing a few songs that make me feel good. See, my brother and sister, if my life doesn't change after such a meeting, I did not have a meeting with the God of the Bible. Because Psalm 95 verse 6 says, Oh, come, let us worship. That means prostrate or fall down flat and bow down. In the Hebrew, it also means bring down low, sink, stoop down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, before Yahweh, our maker. You, we must worship before him, fall down flat before him, bow down before him, kneel before him. He is our maker. And then my life starts to change. When I really get to know the God of the Bible, I stop with things that are not in line with His Word. Even though it may make me feel good, if it's not in line with the Word, I don't want those good feelings anymore. I want that which is in line with Scripture. Every true encounter with God and His Holy Spirit leaves no man unchanged. If people go to such worship experiences, and walk out of such services and just keep on doing the same things in their normal day-to-day -day lives afterwards, living in sin, not changing their ways, then the experience they had at that meeting was not an encounter with the God of the Bible. Hear me very clearly, my brother and sister, because 1 John 1, the 6 to 10 say, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So if we say, oh, I had this wonderful fellowship experience at church the other day. We had a whole praise and worship evening and it was a wonderful fellowship. And then I go back home and I swear and I curse at my wife and children and I drink and I fornicate and I watch pornography. Guess what? I lie, the Bible says. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie 
and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, you see, we must walk the walk, not just talk the talk. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him, God, a liar and his word is not in us. So if you say your supernatural experience was from God, but you're still walking the same walk that you did in the past, your life doesn't change. You're making God a liar, my brother and sister. It is time to go back to what scripture teaches us. And these people also forget that the Bible doesn't say meditate on the gospel songs you sang. No, the Bible is clear that we should meditate on the word day and night. Joshua 1 verse 8, as we saw earlier, someone once said about gospel songs, it may be a nice song and it may have a catchy tune, but the words may just kill you. Beware the words of the songs. Many gospel songs contain bad theology and are not in line with scripture. Here are just two examples. So my brother and sister, I can tell you now, beware the music of Bethel, Hillsong, Elevation Worship, and many of these other charismatic modern churches that come from the New Apostolic Reformation. I also have a whole book that I wrote on the New Apostolic Reformation that I can send to you if you send me an email. Number one, I raise a hallelujah and heaven comes to fight for me. Oh, that sounds so nice. But there is no verse in the Bible saying that all we need to do is raise a hallelujah and then heaven will come to fight for me. No, the Bible is very clear about the spiritual war we find ourselves in, that we need to take up our authority in the name of Jesus Christ to resist these things coming against us. We don't just sit back, cry hallelujah, and then heaven comes to fight for me. It's not scripture. That's bad theology. But we sing the song. It's got a catchy tune. But the words may just kill you because you're not going to do what the Bible says you must do when the attacks of the devil come. Number two, your goodness is running after me. This means I'm going so fast that God's goodness has to run to keep up with me. Can I outrun God then? Actually, the Bible says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of my life. God's goodness and mercy are more like two guards walking behind me to protect me than something that needs to run to keep up with how fast I'm going. No, my brother and sister, that's not scripture. And even beware, this lady singing this song, uh, she's from... Uh, uh, Bethel as well, as far as I remember, on some videos, on some women's days that she had, she says it, and it's on video, it's on YouTube, it's available, it's open domain, where she says the Holy Spirit to her is like a sneaky blue genie. My brother and sister, that's blasphemy, to compare the Holy Spirit to a sneaky blue genie that comes from a, a lamp when you, you know, you rub the lamp, like in the story of Aladdin. That's blasphemy to compare God to demon spirits coming out of a lamp. So beware, my brother and sister, what you listen to and which songs you sing along with. Because Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So if you sing songs like these that are not in line with scripture, you are actually singing lies. You're actually singing death. So just think about it. You're not just singing a song when you're standing there in church. You're proclaiming something in the spirit, either life or death. Is it in line with scripture or not? And on the one video, Alan Parr speaks on the beat regarding worship, praise and worship. And you can go and watch his videos regarding these false worship sessions and things as well. He says the following four points is very important regarding true worship. Number one, worship is not about where you are. It's about who you are worshiping. You see, no matter where you are, at home, at work, in a church building, among friends, uh, in a sports stadium, wherever you are, it's about who you are worshipping. Are you worshipping God or are you worshipping those sport gods? Who are you worshipping? Are you worshipping God or are you actually worshipping yourself? Because I feel so good. This makes me feel so good. I love to love you, Lord. I love to do this to you, Lord. I love to praise you, Lord. Or is it Lord? you are worthy to be praised. 
Lord, only you are holy. Lord, only you are worthy. Number two, worship must be rooted in truth. We can't sing lies to God about God. And I 100% agree with what he says regarding these four points. So if the songs we sing contain bad theology, that means we are singing lies to God about God. And we can't do that. Number three, worship should be God-centered and not man-centered. As I said, Lord, you are worthy to be praised. Lord, you are worthy to be worshipped. Not, Lord, I praise you. I worship you. I am the one doing all these things. Lord, it's all about me doing this for you. No, 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 no. Let's turn it around. It must be God-centered. Number four, worship must be spirit-led. You see, when I have this hunger within me, coming from the Spirit of God, who taught me the Word of God, what will flow out of me will be praise and worship that is led by the Holy Spirit. This author writes, If the great deceiver, Satan, can transform himself into an angel of light, he can most certainly make music that is seemingly Christian when it is actually not. Not every Christian artist should be assumed to be a regenerate, born-again believer communicating proper doctrine, even though their intentions may very well be honest. Because my brother says that if you go and look on YouTube, you will see how many praise and worship leaders of many churches throughout the world have now renounced Christianity suddenly. They were praise and worship leaders for years and years, singing these gospel songs, singing these Christian songs, and suddenly they don't believe anymore. Suddenly they renounce their faith. Why? Because they were not rooted in the word. They were not in a personal intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. They were good singers. They were songwriters. And then they started to be used to write Christian songs. But you see, it was not about the songs, actually. So those songs were actually not from God. The songs could not change them. We must be loving enough to pray for and exhort these musicians, being watchful always. And discerning the times in which we live, because we live in the end times, my brother and sister. And surely we must be careful what enters into our ears, minds and hearts through music. Yes, even so-called Christian music. We must beware, my brother and sister. And I made a note here saying, feel free to check out the whole range of videos that Brylan Riggs and others like Alan Parr also have on YouTube regarding these false worship experiences and the churches and so-called gospel groups that promote them. In other words, there is a warning contained in the way that both these groups I've discussed so far have been doing their praise and worship. And both these groups need to ask the Holy Spirit to show them where their way of worshiping God may not be in line with Scripture. And then they must all be willing to change that which does not please God. Remember, Cain and Abel. And then I end with Philippians 4 verse 7 that says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. My brother and sister, when you are in an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit leads you regarding how He wants you to praise and worship in line with Scripture, you will have the peace of God in your heart regarding these things. Because we must understand, God is always true to His Word. Always. He will not teach you to do something that is against his own word because God is not divided against himself. He wants us to follow him according to his word. He wants us to worship him according to his word. He wants us to clap our hands to him according to his word, not according to our traditions or what we think or what the opinions of other people are. And my brother and sister, you must understand one thing. It's not about religion. Religion is dead. Relationship with Jesus Christ is life. We were so busy with dead religion and I was busy with dead religion in my life for 36 years of my life until in 1999 when I met the Lord Jesus personally. Only then did my life change around and through my intimate personal relationship with him after being baptized with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit giving me a hunger to read this book for myself. Only then did everything in my life change in including the way that I praise and worship him so that he can be glorified. Because remember, he is not a dead God. 
we are not going to stand before a dead God's throne or we are not going to just die and then there's nothing. We're going to stand before a living God's throne one day because Jesus said in Revelation 1 verse 17 and 18, I'm the first and the last. I'm he that liveth and was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And all honor and glory goes to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So let us pray together. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we glorify your name. Thank you, Lord, we know that you are true to your word. Thank you, Lord, that we know that you alone are worthy to be worshipped. You, you alone are worthy to be praised, to be glorified, to be exalted. Because, Lord, you are God, the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. But you are our Abba Father, the Father who loved us first. So thank you, Lord, for so loving us. And because of the love we have in our hearts for you, we want to praise and worship you. We want to exalt you. We want to glorify you. But not in our songs only, Lord, also in our daily lives. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us and help us to do this according to your word. And Lord, because we know your word is true, we also know the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is very close to that. So that is why we keep on crying out, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Because the Spirit and the Bride say, come, for we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen.